Hello and welcome back to Probabilistic Machine Learning lecture number 11. The past few lectures were maybe food for thought for those of you who are specifically theoretically inclined to want to understand exactly how learning machines work. We took a long hard look at one of the most elementary forms of probabilistic machine learning which is the Gaussian framework. We saw how to learn linear and nonlinear functions even with infinitely many degrees of freedom from observations, from real valued observations and we took, we looked very deeply into the theory of these models. We learned about concepts like reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and the associated kernels, feature spaces and eigenfunctions and various other concepts. We understood both the modeling and the computational challenges involved in doing so. And maybe over the course of all of these lectures, you've begun to think, this is getting on a little bit theoretical. It's a bit of an academic exercise. How, what does this all actually mean in practice? So today's lecture is going to be a bit different. To put a bit of an antidote to this load of theory we've been encountering in the past few days. Today we'll do a very hands-on lecture in which we take a deep look at one specific data set and think about how to build a regression model for a concrete application. To do so we'll look at a data set that is very close and dear to my heart because it was genuinely produced by my own body or it reflects data about my own body. So what you see here as um, a scatter plot are recordings of my own body weight over the years from 2009 to the middle of 2013 when the recording ends. I've actually kept records, records since then but for this exercise this is enough. I have Cunningly removed the, the numbers on the y-axis so that you don't know what actually is going on here. So, uh, so that you don't know what my absolute weight was at any point in time. In some sense I've uh, anonymized the data in this way. I can tell you though, um, that much I will reveal, every single gray line here uh, represents one kilogram. And um, so what you can see here, recorded in here, are the usual ups and downs of life um, as a young academic. So uh, this data set starts during my PhD and uh, basically covers the first few years of my postdoc life. And the task we're going to try to address today, maybe one of them, is to predict into the future how that data might continue to evolve. And at this point, before we even look any further at the data or into modeling, I want you to think for yourself, maybe stop the video if you like, about how you would predict this data into the future. Maybe you don't even have to think so much about, I mean, maybe I've already spoiled you by telling you about features and Gaussian processes and regression models and deep neural networks, but maybe allow yourself to forget about these words for a moment and just think about what you would have, what you would do with your mind if you try to extrapolate this data into the future. What is your best prediction for where that number is in, I don't know, 2020? Once you've done that, maybe you've come to the conclusion that you, can, you can't actually do much more than predict a relatively horizontal line into the future with a lot of uncertainty around it. And the reason for that is that I've really only provided you with very little information. I've just told you, actually, I mean, I've provided you with quite some information. I've told you that these are weight measurements and that they are, uh, that they are measured in kilograms. I've even given you a scale for this data. And I've explained what the, what the input is, right? That's exactly the kind of information you often get in a practical setting. When someone gives you a data set, they could, given what I've just done, I could claim that I've told you what this data is, right? Everything is properly labeled with, meta, with metadata. I've told you what the input is, I've told you the scale of the output, okay, maybe there is like a, a constant missing here, but who cares, right? You could just assign an arbitrary constant. What is difficult about this? The difficulty is that I haven't actually provided you with the generative information for this data with the causal structure behind it. 
just by looking at this data, you can clearly see that there is structure in here. But without understanding where that structure comes from, it's very difficult to explain into the future how it's going to continue. And now, of course, this is a bit of a constructed uh, personal example, but of course, there are real world situations like this as well. If you're working as a machine learning engineer in a company, typically you'll get data sets like this as well. And then your first task is to go back to whoever created, collected, or owns this data and ask them much more about this data set. You want to have an interview with the person who created this data to understand as much as possible about where it comes from and where that structure comes from so that you can then include that structure in your model explicitly and use that structure to make much more informed predictions about the future. And that's what we're going to do today. So imagine you just sat down with me and we're doing an interview about this data set. So what I can tell you is going to reveal structure about this data set. And that structure is highlighted in this plot. So here goes that story. It starts in about 2009. I was back then a PhD student. I was living in the UK in a small town called Cambridge, which has a very old university. And it's a bit of a peculiar place. People there live in old monasteries. Um, which uh, even, even though they might be doing a PhD in computer science or physics as I was doing. And one aspect of this weird college life is that you have access to food more or less whenever you want. So in the morning when I would get up, um, I could, if I wanted to, just walk through a beautiful landscape garden into my college cafeteria and get a full English fire breakfast. I didn't always do that, but I did it way too often. And so at, at some point I began being very unhappy with my body weight and I started recording it, which is how this data set was uh, created. And I actually went on a bit of a diet for a while. You can see that here in green over here. However, I was unhappy with the results of that. It was difficult to diet in a place that had so much food. And then something quite positive happened. I um, had a productive conversation with one of my colleagues in the lab Carl Scheffler, a wiry young South African, a real asket, and he um, took me along on runs. And I started running actually very seriously. I went on, went on runs three to four times a week uh, to, at, at, the, at the beginning, just 5K, but then soon 10K, 12K, 18K, half marathons, and I lost weight like crazy. Basically, the story is, if you're running, it doesn't actually matter what you're eating. If you're running enough, you'll always lose weight. So that's this time here. And this time ends around here. I, I distinctly remember in, uh, at the end of uh, 2009, this was uh, the New Rips conference, uh, early December. I was in Vancouver in a nice hotel, running on a treadmill, feeling really great and um, good about the outlook on life. And then I um, went home from the conference and I went actually home to my mother's over, over New Year's uh, and, and Christmas to visit some friends and stay with family. And I totally lost control of myself. I kind of realized that the end of my PhD was in sight and I needed to, get, I needed to start working. And the new phase started where I actually stopped, I stopped running. One of the problems was that my running mate actually at that point left. Um, not because he finished his PhD, but because he wanted to work in Afghanistan um, during the war there, actually. Um, and uh, so I didn't have a running partner anymore. I, started, I stopped running and I started eating again because I had to focus on my PhD. While I was finishing my PhD, I basically gained back all of my weight, as you can see over here. And then in October 2010, I submitted my PhD. And I had a bit of a phase of reckoning. I could, I could start thinking about the world again. And so things plateaued over here. And then I actually moved to Tübingen in, at the start of 2011 uh, to start a postdoc. And I tried to get my life under control again. I had a new phase in life. I had moved, I had a new position. And um, I didn't go on runs anymore that much because I didn't have a running partner and also tubing and isn't as much fun to run in as Cambridge because it's nowhere near as flat as you know. And so instead, something that's much easier to do in Tübingen is to go on a diet because the food here is much easier to avoid and uh, in many ways it's more quality than um, if you get canteen food. So I started losing weight again 
until um, here is maybe a bit of a psychological effect of life as a young academic. So I, I was in a postdoc position, I got stressed about my academic career, I realized that I had to write, start writing papers like crazy to catch up and um, I just hunkered down and started working really hard and so I forgot about doing anything like dieting or sports again for a while and again started losing control of my weight again so it went back up. Then um, I had a bit of a career move and I found time again to go to the gym. This is a third thing I tried. I tried lifting weights and doing like workouts in the gym. You can imagine that that's not quite as um, calorically efficient as going for runs but it had an effect on my body weight as well. Maybe as you can see here in this blue face. And there was even a phase in between where I tried out for a while to eat purely vegetarian. I've always uh, not eaten that much meat, but I tried to like for a while to exclusively eat vegetarian diet. Okay, so that's the story behind this data set. And what we're now going to do is to try and use this structure I just provided to you in this very, very personal one-on-one -on -one interview to uh, predict into the future maybe how my weight could evolve if I took up any of these individual actions again. If I lost control and started eating again, if I continued to go to the gym, if I go started going seriously running again and so on and so on. So before we go get, get into the actual modeling details, let's recap a little bit what just happened here. I've provided you with generative information about this data set. That's a causal structure for the underlying for the sort of observations that you make in this data set. What I've essentially done in doing so is that we've extended the input domain of this function from a one-dimensional space in time to a multivariate space where we have additional features. You could think of these as binary features. So here are um, one, two, three, four, five different activities, right? Running, eating, not eating, going to the gym and eating vegetarian. Five different dimensions along which we've moved. And um, all the information I've given you is essentially binary. So there are certain phases in this data set when we were in, that, in this additional dimension of the data set, we are either at one or at zero because I was either running or I wasn't running. Of course, ideally, you'd like much more information. You would like to know exactly how many kilometers I ran on which day, um, how much food I actually ate. Ideally, you'd like to know the, the calorie content of my food. Believe me, I'd like to know as well, but it's just too much work to write it down. And this is a very typical situation with data sets that you're always missing information. It's no one ever writes down everything, but the more you know, the more information you can collect, the better your model will be. So what we will do now, in a moment, is to try and get that information, what we have, into a model, into a Gaussian process regression framework, and we will try to treat this problem as much as we can as a natural scientific inference problem. We're trying to learn a very simple law of nature, which is the behavior of my body under certain activities. This is perhaps seems like it might seem like a silly example, but it, this really, in my opinion, is what machine learning is. It's the, mecha the mechanization, the trivialization of the process of scientific inference, applying the tools of scientific inference to everyday data sets to massively expand the reach of scientific uh, reasoning beyond the sort of very deep questions that generations of physicists and natural scientists have to think about to everything in our world to be able to predict with much more confidence and understand the complicated nature of our world much better. So to do that, please follow me to my desk where we can open up a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so as always, we start with a bunch of boring stuff. We load up a, a, a bunch of Python libraries. And maybe the only thing to point out here is, apart from the usual plotting stuff, that I'm going to be using a, a library to deal with data that is time structured, that has dates and times. And we're going to use, again, just to re recap this issue, we're going to, to be using very low level libraries here. It's 
linear algebra libraries from NumPy and from SciPy, from these, they, where I'm going to use various variants of Cholesky decompositions and um, Cholesky solvers, linear algebra solvers, random numbers from standard Gaussians to draw samples, and of course, NumPy. The important thing is we're not calling advanced machine learning libraries here. We're not calling PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX or anything else. And the reason for that is that Gaussian inference is just that easy. We do not need more than that. Actually, in the end, we're going to be computing some uh, gradients and one could wonder whether it might be easier to use an automatic differentiation library for this. I will actually leave that to yourself if you want to try it out. Okay, so we've loaded these libraries and now of course we need to start with doing a little bit of I.O. So I actually already load so that I can share the data with you later a data set that has been in some sense anonymized. So what I've done is you can actually see the old code here is I've took the original data and I just subtracted the value at the beginning from it. So that's like a little, my little secret. Um, so that you don't know what the, what the, the absolute value of the weight is. Um, this isn't a standardization in the sense because standardization would amount to subtracting the mean rather than the initial value. And you'll see what the effect of this is later on. And then there's a little fun story that back then I actually stored my data in uh, MATLAB files because um, that was a phase when um, I don't actually know why I did that, but I stored as, sort of as, as MATLAB dates. And there's an interesting story about the relationship between Python and MATLAB, which is that MATLAB is uh, one based and Python is zero based. And the effect of this is that to get the data to actually be, um, be read in the right way, we need to take the recordings of the dates and subtract one year and one day from them. This is the kind of issues you often have with working with data from someone else that they might have been using a different framework and the only way to fix these kind of bugs, which can be very subtle, is to actually look at your data and to understand what the numbers mean that are in there. Okay, so I've already fixed that for us. So now we have a, a pair, pairs of x's and y's. They're actually both univariate. x is the time coordinate. y is the, the, the weight measured at that day. And we'll store the number of these um, observations. And then there's an interesting thing, which is that, of course, all measurements have errors. Any physical me measurement is, is, is always only up to a certain precision. And this error will show up as a, pre as a concrete quantity in our Gaussian inference framework as the noise variance, or actually the noise standard deviation of the measurements, which I will call sigma. And this measurement error, of course, has units. It has the same units as the observations y. So the observations y are measured in kilograms. And therefore, the measurement error is also measured in kilograms. And here, I will set the measurement error to 100 grams, to 0.1 kilograms. Now, I don't just do this randomly without having thought about it. I actually know this because I use a scale to measure myself, to weigh myself. And that scale actually says on the back that it is precise up to 100 grams. Again, we're actually doing physical modeling here and physical quantities matter. So if there is a quantity in your model that you actually can know, like this one, it's a good idea not to try and infer it. We shouldn't be uncertain about things we actually can know because it is going to drastically simplify the inference if we know more and more variables uh, about our data and don't have to track them as latent variables. Okay, now we're going to do um, a little bit of plotting as well. So to prepare for that, I'm um, going to take, first of all, going to transfer, transform all the input variables x, which are stored in essentially uh, like floating point numbers that represent dates in years and minutes and uh, transform them into Python date time structures and then create a plotting scale that um, ranges from the start of the data to the end of the data plus one year, plus 365 days and put a grid with 500 entries on that. Again, this is maybe useful for some of you who are confused by how, how Gaussian process inference works. 
even though the theory is on infinite dimensional objects, objects that are processes. In practice, of course, we are always going to compute with finitely many representers of this data. And here we've decided to test, if you like, or predict on 500 points across the data range and then on top of that one additional year. Okay, that's 500 and um, we create a corresponding plotting grid like, as well by transforming these floating point numbers into daytime objects so that plotting is easier. Okay, let's do that. And now we know what the range of the data is just to double check, it's a little bit of sanity checking. It goes from the um, 4th of March 2009 until the 26th of July 2013. Okay, and now the first thing you do, and this is not just for fun, it's actually uh, like maybe a teachable moment. The very first thing you do with your data is to plot it. And sometimes that's a little bug. Let's fix that. So here we're getting a plot. This is the plot we just saw on the slide, so that's reassuring. We now know that we actually get to see the right stuff here. Um, this is what this data set looks like. It's a little bit small, but you can see the dots, maybe. Let me see if I can fix that. Oh, it's too small. Here we go. Now you can hopefully see it on your screen as well, maybe even larger, like this. Okay. Um, this is important. And you wouldn't believe how many people don't do this. It sounds like a totally trivial thing. Of course you look at your data and everyone in a position like me keeps telling you that you have to look at your data. And yet people in practice often don't do it. So it's important to do this because now you know that you've actually loaded the right data. You can also check whether there's something that's gone wrong with your data. You can check whether the x-axis is right. Here the scale is a bit bad, but I can tell you that it looks good. You can check that the y-axis is, is, is right. You will actually notice maybe I can add a grid so that you can see this. Um, that this here is zero actually. So the data is starts at zero because that's how I've created the data set. So it doesn't have mean zero. It, but it has um, a range that goes from zero to about minus eight in total. Okay. And now what I'd like to do first is to in a quantitative way, redo this thought experiment that we just did in an abstract fashion um, uh, previously to, to just to, to demonstrate and illustrate again that if you don't know anything further about your data, your ability to extrapolate is very limited. So imagine again, I hadn't just given you this little Start, like this little list of personal uh, embarrassing details and instead just giving you this data set and give, has told you as an exercise to just extrapolate into the future. Then it's very difficult to come up with a model that explains what's going on here particularly well. So maybe the naive thing you might be doing, and actually again, this is something many, many people in practice actually do and we'll see that it's not a good idea, is to just do Gaussian process regression with a generic kernel on this kind of data set. So in previous lectures, I've introduced Gaussian process regression. And so you've all actually seen code like this before. You know how Gaussian process regression works. We first define what a kernel is. And so that's the abstract definition of a kernel function. Then define a concrete actual kernel. This time it's the Gaussian or square exponential or radial basis function kernel that we've seen many times in previous lectures. And by now you know that it's actually in many ways a bad kernel, but why not just use that? I mean, any other kernel is going to give relatively similar kind of extrapolatory, uh, extrapolatory behavior. Let's just say, um, well, at least any other stationary kernel. We use a kernel that is the exponential of minus the distance between input points squared divided by two times a length scale. And we'll set that length scale to something. Um, let's think about that in a moment. Now we will define a Gaussian process prior, which is, has a mean function. We'll set the mean function to zero. And we could also set it, by the way, to the mean of the data, but let's just set it to zero to see what happens because that's what everyone always does. So I'm trying to create a bit of a, a straw man here of the, the silly things people might do in practice. 
and then define our kernel. And for that, we have to set this hyperparameter of the kernel. Here is the first interesting insight. It's important to understand that these hyperparameters mean them something. You cannot just set it to one and hope that it works. Similarly to how you can't train a deep neural network without first standardizing your data. So this length scale here um, is the stuff that divides the inputs. So the inputs are and both squared, right? So the inputs are points in time, right? And they're measured in days. So the units of this time measurement in floating point numbers is day, days. So if we set the length scale, then by doing so, we are essentially defining what the time scale is on which we are expecting this data to vary. Well, we can go back up and look at this. So every vertical bar is one year. So clearly the scale here shouldn't be a single day because otherwise this number, this line is just going to wiggle up and down like crazy and it's not really going to predict anything interesting. It's just going to be more or less noise. So instead, let's um, set it to 30 days, which is roughly one month. Okay, I'll do that. And now we can do a standard Gaussian process inference. So we, um, okay, I'm not going to redo this code. It's basically just, we need, we need these three different variables, uh, three different matrices, the covariance matrix of the training data with itself, the covariance matrix of the prediction locations with themselves, and the covariance between the test and the train points. Then we do a little bit of, of linear algebra, which by now you've seen many times, and just run this. And that's going to take a while because it's actually a reasonably large data set. And then we can plot and you'll see that you get this kind of output. So there's a few interesting things to note here. First of all, of course, we're getting exactly the kind of behavior that we already feared we would get. This model is very bad at predicting into the future because as we move away from the data, it, only, it simply returns to the prior mean. I mean, it creates a nice little beautiful plot with a bunch of samples and everything is nice and smooth, but this isn't particularly useful for anything, right? It basically means the data is forgotten after a while. But there's more interesting structure beyond that. For example, we can also see that there's actually more variability in the data than is predicted by this model. So remember that the measurement error is 0.1 kilograms, so it's quite small on this scale. This is zero, this is two, four, six, right? So this deviation from the mean is not explained by measurement error. So there's something else happening on top here, which is not currently explained by this model, which is so confident about its um, output in, in between the data. Another thing maybe to talk about is the width of this sausage of uncertainty here at the end of the data. It's, it has a width of two above and below the mean. That's because I'm plotting two standard deviations and I've implicitly set the scale of this kernel, the output scale, to be one. I haven't actually told you this. I've just sort of glanced over it and not said anything about it. And the, um, that was basically actually a little bit deliberate, right? So this is a case where there is a parameter in your model which you might not have thought about. If I wouldn't have told you about it, we would just have ran past it and not thought about what it actually means. So in fact, this shows up very, very specifically here. So if I decided to scale the kernel, so I could introduce an output scale, let's call it theta, and let's set it to three. Then we can scale the kernel with it like this, rerun the code. Then we will get, I'll go down here so you can already see it, and we'll get a plot that is just wider, right, down here. So now the data is basically scaled down and we're getting a much larger posterior. I could also make that number smaller, not set it to three, but to, but to 0.1. It's just maybe a silly choice, but let's do it. And then the corresponding plot would be much, much more narrow. And this is of course also stupid. So this is important to understand, even if you believe that there are no additional parameters to your model, they might be implicitly there and they might just be set to one or to zero or depending on where they show up in your model to some kind of standard value that you haven't thought about. 
So just by ignoring them, you're not necessarily getting rid of them because they might explicitly show up in a plot like this. So what you have to do to address this issue in practice is to actually look at a plot like this and think about whether it actually represents what you want it to represent. And if it doesn't, then you need to do something about that and fix that in your model. Okay, so there is no gray slide here, but I could go back to this one, right? And tell you this was the first part of, of this exercise. We've just seen that using, blindly using a standard toolbox, like in this case, standard Gaussian process regression with a standard kernel, is not a good idea on real world data about which you know something concretely. Because it's going to predict badly, because it's going to be badly scaled, and because it's going to hide hyperparameters that you should actually choose yourself. And this sounds like a totally trivial statement, but you wouldn't believe how often people in practice in industrial and scientific applications use these toolboxes in this way. And then are surprised that they don't work well and just think, well, that's just how machine learning works. That's the best I can expect. So if you want to fix this issue, you actually have to know what your model does. And that patently means you have to understand the math and you have to understand the computations and you have to do them right. That's what's going to make you an expert by following lectures like this one and other ones in your masterclass. Okay, so to fix um, this, this model, basically to make it actually powerful and useful for something, what um, we need to do is, actually we can do this while looking at this uh, screen again, is to, ex to introduce this causal structure that I've just provided to you in this mock interview um, into the model and use it to make it more powerful. And that involves various tasks. So first of all, we're going to need to find um, ways of representing in our model these causal structures, these specific, let's call them lifestyle choices at various points in time in this model. And those are going to correspond to, well, there's two different ways to think about them. One is that we could think of these as individual extra input dimensions, as I mentioned before. So at a particular point in time, you can imagine that in this phase and in this phase, there is an, another input variable, let's call it gorging, that is at, at a value of plus one here and there and zero everywhere else. And then there is a variable for running, which is at plus one here, and then zero everywhere else, and so on. Notice that this is, of course, imperfect, right? There were other days in here where I went for runs, but we don't know about them. So that's a fundamental issue with modeling. You have to work with what you have. And you could always want better data, but you're always just going to get data with a finite quality. Once we have these features, there is an additional issue that we have to address, which is which we actually just saw when we looked at this basic pedestrian model, this standard Gaussian process regression model, which is that this one model, that smooth model we used, didn't actually capture the dynamics of the data well. It was too confident in its prediction in the regions where um, even, well, there, there were no features there yet, but even in, in like basically in all the regions, the posterior variance was too narrow around uh, within the observations. It, the, the, the deviation of the data from the posterior mean was not explained by the sum of the measurement noise and the posterior variance. So, we, so on top of the features, we also need an explanation for the stuff that goes on in the background. There are uh, clearly, there's clearly structure in here that is not explained by the features. Where that structure comes from, you can have a long-winded theoretical debate about, right? You could come up with all sorts of explanations of where these deviations and this internal structure and a few outliers come from. The fact of the matter is that you can only build a finitely good model about them because we don't have access to the true causal structure that caused all of these minor variations. So these are things like, just to put them into, a concrete, into, into concrete terms, things like I went to weddings at some point in between and birthday parties and barbecue parties in backyards um, which caused spikes upwards and I had the flu at some point, actually I had swine flu at some point in this data set I think and um, various other like, illnesses that caused maybe dips downwards or uh, because I felt bad and didn't eat for a few days, things like this. So these are all hidden in here and they are not explained by the features at all. We need a model that captures these 
You could think of this as measurement noise, but it's not the measurement noise of the scale. It's not a physical measurement error when I step on a scale. It's actually a background process that also causes deviations. And we need a way uh, to encode this sort of uh, missing structure into the kernel for a background Gaussian process. So what we're going to make, the assumption we're going to make is that the true function we we're interested in is a sum of various different functions. Error or noise functions in the background that explain this kind of deviation and the concrete causal processes which we're modeling with these individual features. So I'm going to do this by introducing parametric features for these, uh, these causal structure and um, kernels, non-parametric kernels for the background processes. And as I just said, you can think of these causal structures as additional input variables or you could think of them as additional features. I've actually already started to mix up these, these words in what I just said. The reason for that is that if you, if you remember how Gaussian process regression works, the input dimension x is actually only ever evaluated in features or in kernels. That was the original trick that we used to introduce the kernels in the first place. X never shows up lonely, so to say, in our regression model. It's always first evaluated, like we, we, it's, only, it's always first shoved into either a kernel or a feature function. So it doesn't actually matter what the input dimension of your uh, input space X is, as long as you capture it properly with features. So what I'm going to do in the code is, instead of introducing additional variables, I'll directly encode the features. Whether this makes for beautiful code or not, you can decide for yourself. And I very much invite you in your homework, which is going to be related to this issue, to do this in a better way and show it off in our tutorials and maybe in the flipped classroom and then we can talk about it. So let's go back to our Python code and talk about what we're going to do. So here's a little bit of math to explain again what I just said on the, on the slides. We're going to assume that the function we care about, that's f of t, the, the function that actually explained the data, the generative process for the data, that that's a sum of a bunch of individual functions, which we treat as independent of each other because maybe they actually are. They are a causal structure in my life that is separate from each other. There's going to be two noise processes. We, I'll call them FSE and FW for Wiener, and I'll tell you in a moment what they are. And then there are a bunch of causal functions which are um, given by individual functions for the individual lifestyle choices. So there will be in total, actually, let's go back, there will be one, two, three, four, five of these. One for running, one for eating too much, one for um, trying to lose weight by dieting, one for going to the gym, and one for eating vegetarian. And um, I'll assume that they're all just a um, individual parametric function, so these can be written as an inner product between an individual weight and a bunch of features. So in fact, actually this transpose here is sort of superfluous because there'll be a scalar parameter for all of these. In general, of course, there could be several parameters, but I'm going to choose a set of features such that there's only a scalar feature for every single of these functions. And we'll talk about why we do that in a moment when I define these features. So let's first start with the noise processes. This is the stuff that will have to explain what goes on in this data beyond what's explained by the features. And I will assume that there are two different things at play here. There is uh, one kind of source of disturbances that is self-reverting, mean reverting if you like, which is um, the, which, which I use to uh, capture the kind of processes that just go up and down over your daily life. So for example, I, stepped on, I, I tend to step, step on the scale every day in the morning, but I don't always do that. And of course, even in the morning, you're not always in the same state relative to your sort of your running average, right? Maybe uh, this depends on like how much, how much water I drank the day before and so on, right? Various states of the, of, of the internals of, of my body keep going up and down. And that process doesn't over time just deviate away up or down. It doesn't, it doesn't just keep growing or falling. It's just the sort of internal parts of the process. So for that, I'm going to use a square exponential kernel, which we've used before. So this is basically this kernel, right? But with different parameters, but this kind of smooth interpolant kernel that just reverts back to the mean. 
This will capture the ups and downs of uh, daily life. And then there is an additional process which describes situations like, as I just described, right? I, I, get, I fall ill, I um, go on vacation, I go to, to barbecues and weddings and so on, things to celebrate where I gain weight. And these things are not self-reverting, right? So if you're going to a barbecue party and you, ate, and you eat way too much, then um, it's not like two days from now that weight's just going to be gone. It's actually still added to it. So you can think of this process as a bit of a random walk in life, like a brownie in motion. And that's exactly what I'm going to model. So I'm going to use a kernel here that is the Wiener process. So the Wiener process is the kernel that is given by the minimum between the two inputs. We've encountered it in the Gaussian process lecture, in lecture number nine. And we'll use that to model uh, random drifts up or down that do not then over time naturally decay away again and uh, return back to the mean. I'll add both of these and of course each of these kernels will have parameters. They will have, as you, could, as you just saw up here, they will have a length scale and they will have an output scale. Actually that's the case for the square exponential kernel. The Wiener kernel, because it's the minimum kernel, only has one parameter which is the scale of the drift. So this defines in physical terms the expected distance. This is called the diffusion constant in Einstein's theory. It's the expected distance um, that a particle, or in this case the weight, drifts over a time um, of, a, of over a unit time scale. And then we have to define what the features are. So for that actually I can already run the next, um, next piece of code. So now what we are going to do now is we are going to build these parametric features. And to do that we first need to know what they actually are. So this cell here basically encodes the, uh, the result of the interview, the mock interview you just had with me on screen. So I told you about these individual choices and I told you when I started and ended them by showing you this picture with the colorful like, labels. Right? So I've just transferred these labels into actual numbers. So I, I'm telling you that I started running on the 1st of July 2009 and I stopped running at the 5th of December 2009 and so on and so on. So that's actually the end of the NIPS conference I think that year. And um, then that's the date I started dying and ended dying and then actually then I started again and ended again. Right? I did that twice and I went to the gym. I did that until the very end of this data set actually um, uh, because this data set still ends at the point where I was still going there and so on and so on. So uh, I, did, I ate vegetarian for uh, roughly a month basically, just over a month and so on. And I did uh, twice, there are phases when I ate too much. So this is additional information that is actually maybe part of your X input. But we didn't have it in the original data set, I just provided it to you after you came back to me and asked more questions. This is what you would do in an industrial or scientific setting as well. You go to your data owner, you talk with them about what else they know. And in doing so, they basically provide you with features and then you make use of these features. Now, really, if you're precise, they only provide you with additional information like this one. Your job is now to turn this additional information into a feature. So how do you do that? Well, for that, you will have to make a concrete decision what your thought is about the, the, the causal effect of these choices onto the data. So what I'm going to do is that I will claim that each of these choices adds a linear function to the data. What I mean by that is that whenever I go on this kind of running, I lose a constant amount of weight per day. And whenever I eat too much, I gain a constant amount of weight per day. So there's a constant derivative, that's a linear feature. This of course is a questionable choice. You could argue that that's maybe not true. Maybe you think that um, if you, for example, if you go on runs, then over time you'll at some point reach saturation, right? Where you, your body doesn't actually lose more weight uh, because it's reaching some kind of new steady state. I don't think this actually happened in this phase. Maybe it happened in the gym phase, right? So by making a linear assumption, I'm making a small mistake. Now, the fact of the matter is all scientific models, even the most advanced ones, not the ones for trivial data sets like this, but for 
really complicated stuff, have, make these kind of simplifying assumptions because you have to work with something. And every other choice you could make is also going to have, uh, going to encode some kind of prior assumptions. For example, you could instead say that, let's say if you go on runs, then there is this kind of decay. Well, it's easy to say there is some kind of decay of the, of, of the decrease, but what do you actually mean by that? You have to decide on a concrete shape, right? Maybe you think it's an exponential decay up to some intercept. Then you need the rate of the decay and the intercept. Those are two numbers. You have to set them somehow. These are parameters of your features. Maybe you think there is some, I don't know, some weird oscillation or something, then for the oscillation you need a period that you have to set somehow. So all of this you need to actually choose yourself because you're the machine learning engineer. Of course, you can take the data and use it to help yourself by using it to set the unknown parameters of these features. But even if you just choose like even just by choosing which features to use, even up to parameterization, you're still making prior assumptions. So what I'm going to do is to assume that these uh, are all linear functions, so they all have a constant decrease. And one advantage of this is that I can write this as a linear function, of course, right? I can write this as a feature times a linear weight. We'll notice in a moment that does, that, that, that does not absolve us from having to set hyperparameters, but at least it's easy to do. So I do this in the code here in the next cell, I'm defining feature functions and again uh, I'll leave it to you to think about whether I'm doing this particularly well in code here. So I'm defining individual features. Let's say here is the feature for running. That's relatively easy. And um, what I need to do here is need to define a function that maps from the input domain, which is time, to the real line. And that's going to be a linear function. But because it has start and end times, it has to take those into account. And then we have to be careful to assign correct physical units of measure to these quantities. I will decide to use, so if you're using units of measure, you have to decide what the units are. I've decided to use the units grams per day in, for these features. So those will then be interpretable as meaning this is how many grams you lose per day if you're doing or lose or, or gain if you do this activity. So here is the feature function for running, which is a function that takes in an input time. And then if the time is less than the beginning of, the, of me running, then the feature is just zero. And if it's um, within the, the time when I started and ended running, then it's a linear function that starts at zero and then increases linearly across time from the starting date to the end date. And then at the end of the, uh, of, of the running phase, it just becomes a constant function, it just stays constant. This is important, right? You could think, maybe think for yourself about other ways you would have encoded this kind of linear feature it's not the fact, it, this feature does not start at zero, go, goes all the way up to the end and then drops back down to zero. You can think about what that would do to our regression model. It stays constant. It also starts at zero at the beginning of the running phase. It doesn't start anywhere else. Again, you can think about what other effect this will otherwise have. Now, this is maybe easy. Here's an, an, another feature for dieting. Dieting has the interesting aspect that I did it twice. So there is two start and end dates. And what this code encodes, so it's a bit nasty to look at, you can do that um, slowly if, if you want to stop the video, is that it um, measures when, like it, it, the feature is zero before the start of the first dieting phase, and then it grows linearly until its end. Then it stays constant and then starts growing again until the second end where it becomes constant again. One other way to think about this is again in terms of input domain. So you could think of dieting as a binary choice that, so that each data point, each datum is either at zero or at one. It's at zero if that's during a phase I didn't diet and at one during a phase when I did diet. And then what these features encode is an integral over these days over the values of this underlying input dimension per day. Mm. Oh, across days. And at the end I'm dividing by a thousand. This is because the output variables are measured in kilograms and I want these features to be interpreted in grams. So I'm dividing by a thousand. 
and because this is measuring time here, it's counting days, the total units of measure of this object, of this feature value, are grams per day. And then I do that as well for the other, um, for the other choices, for um, eating, for eating vegetarian diet and for going to the gym, fine. And now what we can do is we can make a plot so that you maybe have an understanding of oh, what just went wrong. Uh, I forgot to run this cell. Let's do it. Do it again. Make this plot. Um, now what you see here is I'm plotting the data set from below just so that you see it. And then in the, in the back with using random colors so the colors don't mean much, I'm, I've, I've defined what the features are. So here, for example, this is the running feature. It starts at zero, then it goes up to a constant value and then stays constant for the rest because I, according to this exercise, never started running again. Um, then here is the dieting feature, which has a, f a first phase and a second phase. Here is the gorging feature, which has two phases as well. And here's the gym feature and the vegetarian feature. Now notice that they all go up to some value and of course it looks like these are not good models for the data because they go up. But what we're going to do now when we do inference machine learning, we're going to learn the weights for these features which are going to turn them around up or down to learn positive or negative weights for them. So to do that we now, this, this is uh, writing down our generative model if you like, the feature functions we now have to actually um, assign a probabilistic model to these, um, this structural description. So to do so, I will define a kernel, a joint kernel, which captures the sum of all of these features and the two noise processes. Remember, sums of kernels are kernels, so the sum, the covariance of a sum of Gaussian process functions is itself a Gaussian process functions with a function with a kernel that is the sum of these kernels. So let's do that. Um, here is actually what I would like to write. This is a, maybe more, um, it's actually a kernel that takes inputs and hyperparameters and then does this in a nice functional way. I had to learn that that's not an efficient way to do it in Python. So you can look at that in the, in the, in, in the no notebook which I'll put on, on uh, Elias afterwards if you like. But this is actually not a, a computationally fast way to do this because um, function abstractions don't work well in Python. So instead I've implemented another version which is a bit more pedestrian um, but um, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't expose uh, an, um, an anonymous function properly but um, it's, a, it's much much faster to, to evaluate. So we already run that. So what this function does is this is really like the core of our inference machine. It's the kernel. It will define a joint kernel that is the sum over the individual processes, the covariances of the individual processes. So that means it's the structure of a kernel. It takes as its input two inputs, A and B, and a bunch of hyperparameters which define the model. So which we will learn in the end. So these hyperparameters have physical values as well. So um, these are, the, these are uh, all the parameters that the kernels and the features have as well. What are those? So let's first unpack them. I will actually store these in um, as, as the logarithm of their actual value because that makes uh, optimization easier. Let's forget about that for the moment. We'll, we'll talk about it more at the end of the lecture. So um, and there will be in this total model one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different hyperparameters. These so hyperparameters are quantities that you have that you cannot do inference on because it's computationally too expensive. Instead, I'm going to optimize them by maximum likelihood, and I'll show you how I'll do that. So, what are these parameters? There is a length scale for the Gaussian kernel that I use for the periodic, uh, not periodic, but for, for the mean reverting process that will define the scale in measured in days on which weight, my weight um, just sort of moves up and down over time according, uh, caused by some random processes that self-revert. Then there is an output scale for the kernel, for this kernel, for the square exponential kernel. So that's the amount of data that has to be explained relative to everything else by this mean reverting process. Then there is an output scale for the Wiener process, for the 
Brownian motion for the random walk behavior. That's actually, um, you can think about this as an output scale or as a drift constant, as a diffusion constant that is measured in days as well. That's the, uh, actually, sorry, it's measured in kilograms. That's the amount or in grams. Here we go, in grams. That's, no, in kilograms. That's the um, amount of weight diffusion per unit time, so in this case per day. And then there are scales, so intensities for the individual features. So why do we have to those, why do we need to have these? So these are going to be multiplicative in front of the individual, these individual features. We need to have these because each of these processes has a different intensity. Going on, going on runs has a different effect on my body weight than uh, eating vegetarian, for sure. So we can actually almost see this from the data. Now, because these show up in a sum, they, their relative scales actually matter. What these correspond to in our prior predictive model are the diagonal entries on our prior feature covariance matrix, capital sigma. This is not going to be a scalar matrix. It'll have individual components, and they, these will capture the relative strength of these individual effects on each other. Notice that annoyingly, we cannot learn these big, um, in a closed form Gaussian fashion because they are a part of the prior covariance matrix. So we just have to live with the fact that we have to set these. So let's say you've set these, then what, this well, what does this function actually do? So um, here I will be relatively superficial. It's, it's probably best if you look at this code yourself on Elias. I defined first a square exponential kernel. We've already done that above, so it's just the same thing again. Now I'm just a bit more careful about the, um, the units. So I first define the kernel without the output scale. Again, it's the exponential of minus square distance divided by two times the length scale, uh, the time scale on which things move up and down. Oh, and then I actually divide by a thousand. So now we know what the output dimension is. It's grams per day. And that's going to be our kernel, and um, we'll, in the end, we'll scale it actually with the, relative, um, with the relative output scale. That will happen at the end of this code. Then there is the Wiener process, which is the kernel that is given by the minimum between two inputs. We've used that in lecture 9. If you want to know more about it, go back there. Um, there will be, this kernel needs an offset because it describes a stochastic process that has a distinct starting time. So I need to put that somewhere. I'll put it to the beginning of the data set minus one day to make sure that even at the first day, there's already a bit of flexibility in this model to start the diffusion. So that we're pretending that the random walk process starts one day before the data starts. That's fine. Why? Because I've scaled the data such that the very first datum is at zero. If I hadn't done that, this would not be the right scale to set. Maybe think about why that's the case for yourself. Then I define the Wiener process, which is a kernel that takes as its input A and B, and then returns, shifted by the offset, the minimum of these two numbers, and again divide by a thousand squared, so square because it's a variance, that will give me units of measure that are grams per day. That's our Wiener kernel. Here we go. Then, um, this, so this function is now written in a way that it actually already takes the inputs and evaluates these kernels. So now we have matrices of corresponding rectangular size in general. Then we evaluate the features. For this, we just have to take the inner product between the individual features because that's the covariance of between of these individual um, functions with themselves. And then we sum up all of these to get one kernel. And here at this point, we actually can multiply them with their individual covariances. These are the scales for the individual outputs. Um, that come, these are all individual hyperparameters and they define the relative size of these individual stochastic processes relative to each other. And then I'm actually also computing derivatives of all of these, let's call them kernels, relative to each other. You can try for yourself that that's actually the correct way to define these derivatives. So what are these? These are derivatives of the individual kernels with respect to their hyperparameters. And um, I'm not going to do the derivation here. This is actually usually quite straightforward. So for the, for the output variances, it's quite simple. It's just, um, you just take the, the, the derivative of, like that's a, this, this kernel function is just that 
individual parameter times the kernel. So you just take the derivative, that's two times the scale times the kernel. Now I'm going to store these individual hyperparameters as their logarithms. So if you take the, the derivative of these expressions with respect to the logarithm of this parameter, we have to multiply with the derivative with respect to the parameter with the derivative of the parameter with respect to its logarithm, which amounts to just multiplying with that parameter again, because you can think of the log um, you can think of the parameter as e to the logarithm of the parameter and the derivative of that thing with respect to its uh, exponential is just the exponential function again. So there's a square here again. The only other uh, term is the more interesting one for the um, square exponential kernel. There is a, a derivative with respect to the length scale, which is a bit more tricky. And you can do that for yourself on a piece of paper if you want to. So this is the point where you could, um, where, where you could also implement this individual expression for an automatic differentiation framework, but I'm not going to do that. So what this allows us to do is now I'm going to define some first guesses for what these parameters are. I um, will assume that the length scale for the mean reverting process is one day, that the length scale for the, the stationary, uh, um, the output scale for the stationary variation is something like 200 grams. I did that by looking at the data a little bit and 50 grams for the diffusion process and 10 grams for each of the features because I don't know yet. Take 10 grams per day for each of the features because I don't really know yet how good they are. If we do that, we can then do essentially Gaussian process regression, right? Or actually um, first check whether this model is any good by, and this is again an important point, something you do at first, by drawing from the prior. So this is something you can do in a probabilistic model that is basically impossible in a statistical machine learning model. If you have a prior, you can draw samples from the prior and use that to investigate whether your model is any good. I do that by building the kernel gram matrix over all the data, adding a little bit of a nugget to make it definitely symmetrically, symmetric positive definite, multiplying with a random number, adding a prior mean, which I've set to zero, so I'm not adding it, and then just making a plot. And this is what this plot looks like. So, this is a, the kind of plot you should definitely do if you can and um, use it to see whether your model is good. What, what do we actually do here? So what I've plotted here is I've, I've plotted the true data set and then on top three samples. So here I've plotted, you can see this up here, I've plotted the true data set in the same color and then three random samples from the model. So one thing you should do now is to look at this plot and decide for yourself whether you can still make out the true data. Maybe you can, and the reason for that is that we haven't set the hyperparameters of the model quite right yet. So you can, for example, see that the output scale, so I mean, clearly you see what, what the data is and what the, what the samples are, right? There are these three more compressed lines. Um, and what's clearly happening here is that A, the output scales are wrong. So probably these stochastic processes have to be a little bit wider. And then B, the scales of the individual features are probably wrong. This data doesn't move quite enough in this region or in this region, and it moves more than enough in this region than it should. So this means that the relative scales of these features are off and we need to fix these. So we'll do that in a moment, but before we do that, let's maybe take a quick break here and understand what we just did. We defined a physical model that captures our assumptions about what's actually happening in the data. And then we implemented it and then we tested it by, before even looking at the data properly, sampling from the prior, I mean, before allowing the model to look at the data, we looked at the data actually, sample from the prior and compare it to the data to get a feeling for whether we've even described something meaningful. And maybe looking at this uh, picture, it does look like we've, put, we've constructed something interesting that does capture a lot of the structure, but the scales aren't quite right yet. The hyperparameters of the model aren't right yet. So what we're going to do now is hyperparameter inference, hierarchical Bayesian inference, to fix exactly this issue. So at this point, you might be looking at the clock and, and, and thinking, well, now we've already talked for one hour. For one hour. What is uh, he going to do in the next half hour? How is he going to finish all of this? It seems like we're only beginning to do uh, actual work on this data set. Well, in fact, we're actually almost done now because we've done all the hard work. We've defined the features, we've figured out um, the, all the right physical uh, 
not the right physical scales, but the right physical quantities to describe our model. We've collected the data and now all that's left to do is the mechanical part, is the computational part. It's machine learning. So let's go to our code and see what we can do next. So um, we've created our samples. Now all we are left, we've, we've left to do is to compute marginal likelihoods, so an evidence for the model, optimize the parameters of that model to maximize this marginal likelihood, and then evaluate the posterior. Let's do these one after the other. And I'm not going to go through too much detail of how this is actually implemented. It's probably best for you to just look at this code yourself and compare it with the more abstract derivations we've seen in lecture 9. So we're going to evaluate the uh, log likelihood. Actually, we're going to evaluate minus 2 times the log likelihood because that's a function we can minimize to the minus. And the 2 doesn't matter, it just simplifies the, ex the expressions because we're just looking for the minimum of this function. And we'll also compute gradients of this to hand them to a numerical optimizer. So let's do that. In this function, I'm defining what the li log likelihood is. I'm essentially implementing this function up here. So for that, we need the data, we need the values of the hyperparameters, and every time the optimizer is going to evaluate this log likelihood function, we will compute the corresponding kernel matrices and the derivatives of these kernel matrices with respect to their inputs. Then compute the kernel gram, uh, the, the, the covariance matrix of the data, which is the kernel matrix plus the noise covariance. Then compute log determinants. And um, so this is actually the, the log determinant of a symmetric matrix, symmetric positive definite matrix. Compute this expression here in the middle, this quadratic function, this quadratic form, where we take an inner product. And for that, we solve once from the left hand side for g and then multiply with um, y from the other side. And compute gradients. So for this, I'm using the results that we had on the corresponding slides for differentiation in lecture 9. Just compute that. So this is actually easily implemented. Now, at this point, what I've done is I've implemented a gradient. And I've told you in previous flipped classrooms that whenever you implement a gradient, you have to make sure that it's actually the right gradient. So to, to do that, I will include in this um, notebook, even though I'm not actually going to run it now because it takes too long, but you can look at it later, a piece of code that actually compares the analytic derivative that is implemented here in these three lines with the numerical value for the derivative, which you can approximate by a finite difference. So we just take uh, individual values of all of the hyperparameters and for each hyperparameter, once evaluate to the left and to the right, and take the finite difference and um, this balanced finite difference and divide by the distance and then compare these log likelihood values to each other. So um, you can actually look at what the output of this is. This is essentially a test to see whether the analytic computation and the numerical computation are the same. And then I'm also plotting the relative distances and you see lots of small numbers here. Everything is much, much less than one. So therefore, this computation is reliable. It actually computes the correct gradient. Good. That's just a unit test. Of course, you should always do unit tests, but um, we shouldn't spend too much time on that now. It's easier for you to just look at this yourself. So we're just going to uh, go to this cell here. Here, I'm loading an optimizer. This is one of these black box methods. We're not even going to talk about exactly what this optimizer does. For once, let's just rely on a little black box. And what this thing is supposed to do is it will try to minimize the negative marginal log likelihood of our model. So it'll, it's going to try and make our model predict the data as much as possible under the prior. So to make the prior as close as possible to the, actually, the actual data we, got, we get to see. To do so, I'm handing this function the, um, the handle to our log likelihood function, which returns function values and gradients, an initial value for the hyperparameters, the one we set above and draw two samples from. I'm telling this function that there is actually a gradient, the Jacobian to compute. So please use that and try it. 
and then I'm telling it to do this at most 15 times and to display the output. So I'm actually going to watch this a little bit with you as it's running. So this takes a little bit of time and what you can see here is in every time we get an output because I've plugged, I've written the corresponding code into the um, piece of code above that, this, that computes the log likelihood. We see where the optimizer tries to evaluate the hyperparameters and plot out the negative log likelihood. Sorry, the actual, uh, the negative log likelihood, yeah. So this is a number that we're trying to get small rather than large. The first evaluation that the optimizer makes is at a value of 5,371. So the probability for the data is minus uh, e to the minus 5,371. It's a very small number. That's why we are using logarithms of likelihoods rather than likelihoods. Otherwise, we would get into trouble with our floating point range. The next time we, the optimizer tries something, we are at a much, much better value. So remember that we're trying to get this small. The optimizer does something smart, it plays around and actually then and has to try a few larger values. This is while it's doing a line search to decide how far to step and then finds an even better value. And now as this thing iterates, we will quickly see it find relatively good values. So these are um, about a factor of 10 or more, actually more like a factor of 20 less in log space, which is extremely more likely, right? For the data, while this runs, um, we can basically lean back and watch our machine learn, right? So the process that you're observing here is literally the machine learning, right? It's uh, trying out different values for the hyperparameters of the model, trying to find good uh, values. And you can see that this takes a little bit of time, but we can actually do it while we're watching it. Now compare that with uh, deep learning where you might have to um, wait for a little bit longer. You'll have to, you might have to play around with different optimizers. You might have to subsample, do stochastic optimization, use stochastic gradient descent and so on. And you might have to rerun this code more uh, over and over again. Here, we are done once we've run it once. And we can rely on this optimizer doing something meaningful because it's not a stochastic problem. It's a deterministic problem. Our optimizer tells us that it has done 15 uh, iterations, which required 19 evaluations of the function, and it has reached a value of 258, which is a reduction in log space of about a factor of 20. That's pretty good. And now we can see or ask um, the code what were actually the values that the um, optimizer chose. So um, these are the values that it found. These are the corresponding values of the estimated inverse Hessian of the objective function at that point. None of this is actually all that important for us. The most important uh, uh, thing is the, this choice here. Those are the values of the optimal hyperparameters. Now remember that these are the logarithms of the actual hyperparameters because that made optimization more efficient. So instead, let's print the, um, uh, the exponential of those values. And now we can look at these and remember what they actually all are and they will give us an interpretation of um, the numbers that this thing has found. So remember, uh, I need to go up a little bit. The hyperparameters were defined to be, uh, maybe I should have copied that somewhere. Here we go, How, you know what? I'm just gonna copy this down so that we can look at it together. So the optimal found hyperparameters put them here. Our, this one is the, is the length scale of the stationary noise process. It's actually less than a day. This is the um, output scale of the, the stochastic this, uh, mean reverting noise process. It's actually it's on the order of grams, right? So this is about 600 grams, half a kilogram of up and down motion um, just in this noise process. This is the scale of the diffusion time. So that's in grams per day. So we're talking about um, 89 grams a day of random walk up and down. That may seem relatively sane as well. And then these are the relative scales in grams per day of these individual um, causal processes. So we see that they are not the same anymore, even though they were initialized to be the same and that they have different values. In particular, the one for running is quite large compared to the other ones. It's something like um, 90, uh, 29 grams per day for, for running, something like uh, 
nine grams a day, so almost zero for eating vegetarian and so on. But those are just the scale of these, of these priors. They are not the actual values, the predictions for the weights of these features. To get those, we now actually compute our Gaussian process posterior over the noise processes and the weights. We can do that relatively simply by applying the linear algebra part of our model. So that's the, 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 basically the code again that we spoke about in lecture 9 and also before that in lecture 7. So um, we can now actually do that one after the other. The first thing I'm going to do is to draw samples from the prior of this model. So that's the model that has been tuned such that its hyperparameters are creating a prior that is hopefully well suited for the data set. So let's check whether this is actually true by drawing a bunch of samples from this prior and comparing them again with the true data. So in this plot that you see here, somewhere hidden is the true data. And there are three other samples, I think it's three, no, five other samples from um, the prior of our model. Now, the question to you is, do you still see the true data? Well, maybe you do because you by now memorize what the data looks like and because you know that in the first phase it has to drop and not rise. But other than that, this is actually a pretty good prior distribution over potential outcomes. I think if I just run this a few more times, you'll um, see that, I mean, you don't really, there's nothing really that stands out. There's not really a reason why one of these plots um, stands particularly out over the others. So that means we've done a good job. We now have a good prior model. Our Gaussian process prior is now a pretty good one for this data set and we can compute a posterior. So the posterior distribution is a joint distribution over all, so I do that here, I compute, I do the actual linear algebra part. Those are the final five lines of the Gaussian regression code that we had in lecture seven and in lecture nine and um, then make a plot. And now you see what the posterior looks like. This isn't in itself all that interesting yet, but it's already a much better model. You see that um, we now have a range of posterior variants. These are these um, dashed lines that actually in includes the entire data. So we don't have this overconfidence anymore and we get an extrapolation that is relatively sane. It's actually constant, the reason for that is the Wiener process prior, which uh, um, yeah, describes this uh, Brownian motion behavior into the future. This is under the assumption that there are no further features after, afterwards. So remember the way I've defined the features is that I've assumed that after the end of the data, there is none of these lifestyle choices are active anymore. So what we see here is the model predicting what happens if you don't do anything. If I don't start running again, if I don't go to the gym, if I don't diet or eat or anything else, this is the random walk behavior that the model keeps predicting. What however would happen if I would continue to make one of these lifestyle choices? Right for this, we have to look at the marginal posterior over the individual weights of these features. And to do so, we can compute these. Um, doing so requires to compute a marginal. For this, we can use the fact that the model we're building is a sum over individual components, two noise processes and five different features. And we want a marginal over one of these features. To do so, we just have to project the posterior over the entire function out onto the single marginal for this one quantity. Doing so, it's easiest for you to just wrap your head around by staring at it for a while, is to compute these, this marginal vector over the weights. So this means we compute the Gaussian process posterior almost, like we multiply the um, observations with the inverse of the kernel Graham matrix, and then we just compute the covariance between the data and the individual components of the function, which are the feature functions scaled by their prior covariance. We do that. So this is again something it's easiest for you to just actually look at this code later. It's not good if I go through this line by line because it's just going to be like tedious for some of you. So I actually compute these, the entries of this vector. And then um, I'm, uh, 
so these are individual numbers that come out, right? There are five different scalars about uh, each of which actually we have a joint Gaussian posterior over them with a joint covariance matrix. So I care about the individual elements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the means plus minus one standard deviation for these individual effects. And for that, I just have a little bit of like Python code here to print formatted, well formatted sentences. And we get in quotation marks, a scientific answer to the uh, inference problem of how do individual lifestyle choices affect my personal body weight. And it turns out that if I go running in the way I went running back in the day, I would lose typically about 30 grams a day plus minus 7 grams. And if I go on a diet, I lose a little bit less on average, but actually within the error bars, these two are almost the same value, about 25 grams a day. And so you can see that these are not extremely large values, right? They are not, they are not like kilograms uh, per day, which is not surprising because these are, these are actual systematic changes. They're not just random fluctuations. And the other two lifestyle choices, three lifestyle choices, have a uh, different effect. So, so eating too much is actually almost as, like, as bad negatively as going, going on runs and dieting. And um, going to the gym has a relatively weak effect. And eating vegetarian has perhaps almost no effect. So this line is actually the most interesting one. Why is this number so small? And the error bar on it is relatively low. Well, the reason for that is that we actually have a very minor data set only for this. So it's clear that from these few observations, it's basically impossible to infer the effect of eating a vegetarian diet or not, right? However, that's okay. So this is maybe reflected in this prediction here. The mean prediction is basically zero because we don't know. But what's interesting is that this error is so small. This algorithm is relatively confident that this is the right explanation. Why is that? Well, the reason for this is that we are up, up above, have computed um, a maximum likelihood estimate for the hyperparameters of this model. Now, maximum likelihood estimation does not like it, it, well, it includes this, this Occam's term that we spoke about in lecture nine. And the best way to make this model less complex in terms of the Occam factor is to just make this variance of this particular additional component as small as possible because it's not needed to explain the data set. So the model actually is quite confident that it doesn't need this parameter to explain what's going on. Now, that's not maybe the answer you're looking for. Maybe from a scientific perspective, you want to say that you know that there is an effect to eating, eating vegetarian, you just don't know yet what its value is. To fix that, you would need a prior, so that's a penalty term in our optimization problem above, that enforces that the size of this effect is non-trivial, that is not just zero. And you can think for yourself about how you would do that. If you don't know how, maybe ask me in the feedback or in the flipped classroom and then we can talk about it. So we're almost done. The final thing I haven't shown you yet are the other two components of this stochastic process. So we, dis we describe this data set in terms of seven components, five of which are causal and two of which are noise processes. The noise processes in this plot above here are already included here in this prediction. But we can also look at these individually, just like we can look at the effect of the individual um, features. So to do so, we can just plot the Postivia and prior distributions for these two noise processes separately. And for that, you basically have to adapt this function up here, this posterior, instead of the covariance with the weights. Here, we need the covariance with these noise processes, which are just the individual kernels for these noise processes. So to, when, when I do that, I get a plot like this. So what I'm, I can tell you what I do here. What I'm plotting here is the full posterior above that you just saw above, it's just replotted. And then below, plots about these two different noise processes. This plot is the plot for the, stock, for the mean reverting noise process, the one that just make, describes the ups and downs of daily life that get corrected automatically. And here I'm plotting in solid red, the posterior mean. So what the model thinks actually happened in my life. And um, in dark black, the uh, 
posterior samples, so that's other possible explanations of what happened in my life, and in gold, draws from the prior. So because these overlap and they basically look, just look like smoosh, just like noise, we, that's actually a good message. This means that the prior is actually a relatively good description of what's going on. This is interesting because it means that, at least according to this model, there are no other underlying causes that are badly described by um, this model. Right? If, if there was something else more structured going on in this data set, then we would expect these red dots in this, in this plot to show up very clearly outside of the prior predictions. So that's good. Let's look at the same plot for the um, not mean reverting, for the random walk uh, noise process that is also in there. Here again, we see in red the um, posterior mean and in black draws from the posterior distribution over this uh, process and in gold draws from the prior. Now here you um, could argue that there's maybe a little bit of structure hidden in this data set in so far as this red line is a bit more regular than um, maybe we would expect but this is a very minor effect. So the black draws, posterior draws, do seem a little bit more um, structured going up and down on different time scales than the, than the golden uh, draws from the prior and this might mean that there are still some individual effects that are not just totally random at, at uh, constant time intervals ups and downs but for example there might be some seasonal effects in here as well but overall this is a very minor kind of effect. So having done this kind of posterior discussion maybe looked at the data done some some sanity checks these plots might convince us that what we've built here is actually a relatively expressive model for this particular data set. And what we've learned from it is that, or at least personally, I for me have learned that if I make certain choices in my life, I can expect certain changes in my body weight over time and um, that they are roughly the same regardless if I either start to eat less or very seriously start to, to work out and that allows me maybe to take a, a better decision about how to structure my life. So at this point, you might be wondering why you have to watch me do this uh, perhaps overly intimate and personal analysis of my, of my own uh, lifestyle choices. Well, this exercise was essentially just a placeholder example for a forecasting problem. And so what we've done here is We've looked at a time series that evolves over time and is affected by certain causal processes which can be chosen to be followed in a particular way. I can choose myself to go on runs or eat more or less and a company could decide to run a promotion or to switch suppliers or to uh, lower their prices or raise their prices and try to predict whether all these choices would have an effect on their sales. So to drive that point home, I can tell you that in um, 2016, Amazon, the team, a team in Berlin um, led by this guy, Matthias Seger, who is actually an alumnus of uh, Tübingen, made the interesting decision to release a paper at, at New Rips or publish a paper at New Rips which essentially more or less reveals how they do their demand forecasting. So here is a large company with a, with a, a large amount of item in stock, not just one individual one like in my example but many many thousands or hundreds of thousands of items and they would like to predict how much of these items they are going to sell at particular points in time and there are underlying causal reasons why items sell. Some of them are controllable, like you could decide to do a promotion or lower or raise their prices. Others are not controllable. For example, there are maybe just seasonal fluctuations. There are effects out in the world that cause certain items to become more popular or less popular. Whether, it doesn't really matter what the case is, 
one way or another you would like to describe these kind of causal processes and to do so you have to build more or less exactly this kind of model. For every individual item you have to build a time series and predict how it's going to evolve into the future. Now, Of course if you don't do this for a single time series but for hundreds of thousands of items then you have to think a little bit more about the computational details and how to implement this efficiently. That's what this paper is about. But the model underneath is very much more or less exactly the kind of model we, d we constructed today. So what I've done sneakily while showing you data about my own weight tracking uh, process is I've given you an introduction on how to do forecasting in general in an industrial setting. With that, we're at the end of today's lecture and I'd like to summarize. So what we did today was a hands-on example of how to build a predictive Gaussian model that describes a particular data set. We saw at first that if you just take a time series and don't understand, don't, with, that doesn't come with further understanding of how it was created, it's usually very difficult to predict anything meaningful into the future because the structure that um, is represented in this data set it's typically very hard to find. The space of possible explanations is just so large that you can't expect to just guess it. Unfortunately, that's something a lot of people try to do. What's a much more promising approach is to go and talk to the owner of the data. In this case, that was myself. So we simulated this process a little bit and try to extract knowledge about the causal underlying generative process for this data implement that in terms of parametric feature functions. We, choose, we chose today particularly simple feature functions. In general, you would want to encode what you think you can encode about this data set. To do so, you have to strike a balance between what you would like to do and what the data actually allows you to do given how much information it contains. And then the remaining process is actually a relatively mechanical one. You build a Gaussian process prediction model, optimize the hyperparameters of this model, and you saw me do this in a quite hands-on fashion so that you actually keep looking at the data, you keep doing unit tests and sanity checks, and this process of actually looking at data and model in a meaningful way to compare them with each other and see whether they work is something that unfortunately very many people in the industry don't do. So if you want to have a well-working model, you have to do these kind of sanity checks. And these amount essentially to unit tests in the machine learning domain. The resulting model that we arrived at provided a meaningful, maybe semi-scientific answer to this admittedly quite banal problem of predicting the dynamics of my own body weight. And that problem is very directly related to many real-world tasks in industrial and scientific setting, settings that have real economical, scientific, even societal value. For example, all problems of forecasting, of for example demand and supply, predicting returns on stocks and other items you can buy and sell, decisions on what kind of promotions you want to show, what kind of ads to show to users, and so on and so on. The ability to build these models clearly goes beyond just using black boxes. And to be able to build such models in a really good way, you need to have an understanding of the mathematical model that drives this entire process, and also a kind of a hands-on grid on that allows you to actually work with the data and not just wave some, fun some uh, mathematical formulas around. I tried to show you an example of how to do that today. It's obviously a very limited, simple example geared to a compact lecture, but I hope I've given you an idea of how to build concrete probabilistic machine learning models for this kind of relatively simple structured regression problem yourself. With that, we're at the, we're at the end. Thank you very much for your time. See you next lecture.